Castle in Quadling Land, somewhat aloof and mysterious. And here to discuss Glenda, the character, uh, how she appears in all sorts of Oz media, and what mysteries she may hold are uh, three delightful and knowledgeable Oz fans uh, in uh, the order that I see them on my screen. We have Mari Ness, the poet and author of short stories that appeared in many anthologies also known for her critical reassessments of classic fantasy literature, including the Oz books, at Tor.com. Uh, Mari, would you wave to the audience so people know who you, which one you are? <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> uh, next is Caroline Specter, author in the Wild Card series in the Shadowrun and Earthdawn universe and numerous other stories and game modules, and once an associate editor at Amazing Magazine and folks who uh, attended what used to be the Winky Convention, we'll know Caroline from our conversations there. Hi, Caroline. And finally, Atticus Ganaway, author of The Silver Sorceress of Oz and other Oz stories, former editor of The Balm Bugle, and current book review editor and frequent contributor for The Bugle. Hello, Atticus. <laughs> and I'm J.L. Bell, former editor of Oziana and author of some award-winning Oz short stories, as well as other fiction and nonfiction. And to start us off today, uh, I want to ask uh, each of our panelists, uh, starting with Mari, what do you find interesting about the way Glenda functions in the Oz stories? Uh, is she an avatar of something? Is she a uh, mother figure or a mentor or something? And also, how old do you imagine her to be? What's your picture of Glenda from reading the books? Well, I don't really see her as any sort of family figure. I think she's basically the Merlin of the, of the books. Um, so she's a mentor, and she very much, I noticed when I was doing some rereading for this, um, she sends people out on her behalf. She rarely actually leaves her little castle, or I guess huge, luxurious, wonderful castle. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was the wrong term for it. But she uses agents to have everyone else do her work for her, which I find very interesting um, because it's uh, it, it echoes back and it just is a reminder of how this is a, a very typical theme in number of fairy tales in the number of the great legends, and it just allows Oz to fit there in a very long history of, yes, the mysterious magical woman sends you out on a quest. And she never really changed that in that role for all of the original 14 books, which is also impressive given how many of the other characters did change along the way. So there's a consistency there. Uh, I think she's thousands of years old. I and is... For that? <laughs> that's what I think. She's mm -hmm. thousands of years old. Okay. Caroline, anything uh, from your perspective that strikes you? Oh, God, I'm going to get myself in trouble right off the bat. Um, uh, this isn't just from the books. This is a, she is a Deus Ex Machina in a lot of ways. I mean, she literally, literally does it in the 1938 movie. She sort of floats down and oh, here's the solution. Um, and I also see her as a bit of a plot coupon. Whenever Bomb sort of gets himself in trouble, he's got Glinda there to help him out. Um, and um, but uh, and you know, like the field mice and. All these different places where where um, where she is is helpful to move the plot along or solve something that's a problem. As for her age, like Mari, I, I also believe that she is incredibly old. Um, uh, in some ways, I think she's probably as old as Oz itself. Maybe um, it's unclear to me because you know I don't even know if she's part of Oz originally or not. Um, her past is shadowed. Um, and Baum refers often to the fact, and she refers often to the fact that she's, you know, she's older than she looks. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's, that's what I think about her. I think she's wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you. Atticus, any thoughts on your side? Sure. Um, well, I did sort of a semi-deep dive into some of the books. It's been a, a little while um, in, in 
preparation for this. Um, I mean, just off the top of my head, I guess what came to mind um, was a sense of her as a kind of spiritual advisor or priestess um, to, you know, Ozma in, in, in particular, and Dorothy, I guess, in yeah, the first book. Um, but, um, but looking more, more literally at, uh, at the text of the books themselves, um, in the land of Oz, she very much triggers and shapes the entire sequence of events that restores Ozma to the throne. You know, the Scarecrow asks for her help in removing Ginger because Ginger's a usurper, and Glinda says, well, so are you, basically. Um, you don't have a rightful claim to the throne either. And Glinda reveals the existence of Ozma, spends the rest of the book looking for Ozma so she can disenchant her. So she very much determines the entire trajectory of, you know, the country for ever, basically. Um, so, you know, she's a little, little tiny thing she does there. Um, and then in TikTok of Oz, it says that she's the official sorceress of the kingdom who constantly guards the peace and happiness of Oz. Um, so I was looking for little things that Bomb says. Um, I mean, in that instance, um, he's talking about her being the guardian of Oz in the context of she just sort of twists uh, around the way that Queen Anne and the army of Ubu are going and just sends them off somewhere so they don't bother anybody. She doesn't even tell Ozma she's doing it and just goes she, on. She forgets. I mean, right. she, she, it's just, <laughs> and that's the last who knows? She, Right, who knows that's the last other... mm-hmm. um, But in terms of her age, which is always, you know, that delicate topic, um, <laughs> and, you know, the first reference to her is the soldier with the green whiskers uh, in the first book who says Glinda knows how to keep young in spite of the many years she has lived, and Scarecrow has it says no one knows her age, and that's really all books ever say i was i was kind of surprised i thought there would be a little more um i mean i would tend to to think you know if you're not saying then it must be a lot um and uh, that's all i could say in quantifiable terms in descriptive terms um she multiple times is is referred to as being tall and she wears splendid gowns that trail behind her and then you know Right after that description in Glinda of Oz, for instance, um, Ozma and Dorothy are described as wearing simple white muslin gowns. So Ozma might be roughly as old as Glinda is. I mean, she comes from that fairy tribe. But um, in terms of outward appearance, Glinda very much wants to seem older, I think, which is interesting. Yes, she definitely wants to be the adult in the room with those two girls that she looks after, uh, even as Ozma grows up. Um, it, it strikes me um, that sometimes that she functions as, a, as you know, the very best teacher in the world, the teacher you want to have. Uh, she's encouraging. Uh, she certainly teaches the wizard all about magic, but she also somewhat has that function for Dorothy and Ozma. Um, and uh, indeed, she is a delightful person to have on your side, uh, especially since she has this large army. She seems to have the largest, most efficient military force in Oz, uh, and how does that, do you think Baum is telling us something about Glinda and about the nature of ruling through her army? Or is this just an excuse, another excuse for a line of chorus girls in his mind? Uh, anyone? Uh, I, I think it's an issue of power. I think that uh, for me at any rate, um, she feels to me as if she's the always going to be the power behind the throne. She doesn't want to rule directly necessarily except for her own little country. But, um, but I think that, that she very much is, she's an advisor. She, she, you know, basically that army is at the disposal of Ozma. And that's, I think that's pretty clear um, from just from the, the relationship that they have. Um, I, I can imagine her being the protector of Oz, even as Ozma is, um, you know, functioning as a ruler. Um, but I also had, where is that note? Um, the thing about her educating the wizard. I also think that that's a very powerful statement because she takes somebody who is a humbug and who is there and who is clearly not a fairy land or anything else. And she makes, who's human and she turns him into a real wizard, which indicates a great amount of power, at least in my book. So. Yes. Although Bob also makes clear that, uh, she knows more than he does. 
Oh, okay. She does not tell him everything. Yeah. She also, uh, but uh, given the standing army, one of the things I found fascinating is she doesn't really rule that much of the Quadling country. They're constantly going around. I mean, yes, the adventurers are in more countries than just the Quadling country, but all of these characters keep going into the Quadling country and saying, oh, well, we didn't know about this. Nobody told us about this. And those characters have also never heard of her or of Ozma or of anyone. So she has a standing army that she doesn't do anything with. She, which fascinates me because, you know, uh, Baum was very much writing in post-Civil War times as the U.S. was continuing to keep a military that wasn't always in use and this and there was some a lot of questions about can we actually afford this military what are we doing with this military and bomb of course was also out um in the midwest um in the dakotas dealing with issues where people were like okay yes you do need to send in the military and there would be major arguments about the use of that military so i think that very much feeds into you have a person who has the capacity to be an absolute dictator easily. And yet she's not even paying attention to many of the small kingdoms that are very close to her, to her castle. It is interesting to look at, for instance, the Scarecrow of Oz, where she uh, sends in the, the Scarecrow to uh, fix things there, but obviously knows that things have been happening uh, in Jinxland for quite a while, and yet doesn't do anything until a little American girl is in trouble. Uh, and then Glinda of Oz, our centenary book this year, uh, she starts out the book advising Ozma to do nothing, uh, which is an interesting uh, thing connected with uh, the recent, when Baum wrote that, the very recent discussion over neutrality during World War I and whether uh, going off to try to fight, settle this war in Europe would be any more successful than Ozma and Dorothy going off to fight, settle the war between the Flatheads and the Skeezers. It, yeah, there's also, and going back to what they're wearing and their dresses, she works to look imposing. Ozma is <laughs> like, we're just girls, so no one will hurt us. It'll be <laughs> great. Um, <laughs> so there's a very different relationship there of, um, yeah, you know, I'll just wear a simple dress and everybody will like me because everybody likes Dorothy and they like me, so that will solve the problem. Glinda doesn't really work that way. One thing that really shocked me when I went back and looked is her army only appears in the first two books. That's it. Um, in fact, in the Scarecrow it explicitly says um, when, when Trot shows up at, at Glinda's palace, she says, why is nobody guarding? And she said, because Glinda's so powerful, she doesn't need that. Um, so the army's gone, basically. Um, oh. And she has these hand, beautiful handmaidens. Talks about how beautiful they are. Um, how they're weaving all the time. Um, so I think that, that, that really threw me for a loop I, because I had this really strong impression of her army, but it's only in the first two books in, in, the, in the series. That's well, that would impressive. Yeah. Uh, perhaps it's the same, uh, the, those young women weaving and doing their embroidery are also, <laughs> at a moment's notice, grabbing their guns and spears. Uh, she does seem to uh, have an appreciation for the female beauty. And uh, this makes an interesting connection with uh, the stories, usually outside the canon, about her falling in love. Uh, do you think that it's in character for Glenda to be falling in love with anyone, male or female, young or old? I mean, over several thousand years, probably it happened once, but I tend to, you know, <laughs> at least once just to try it out. But I tend to think she, yes, she appreciates beauty. Uh, she's clearly surrounding herself with young girls, but I see her more as she's moved past romance. It's not her focus. So she's not searching for it. She's either had it or didn't, but, you know, she's got her own thing that fascinates her. Um, I don't necessarily think she's completely asexual, but she tends to re lean in that direction for me. Well, Bob and, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Bob describes her as spending all of her spare time refining her knowledge and experimenting and doing new things, like 
you, you really makes a big point of that. Um, so I think that really ties in. In looking for illustrations of Glenda portraits to uh, share with for this, there are just I found just a remarkable number of uh, pictures of her reading, reading scrolls, reading the great book, reading other books. Uh, she is a, a really great reader, and uh, <laughs> it's something which I think we can all relate to. Uh, <laughs> Caroline, you uh, at one of the Winky conventions had. Uh, uh, <laughs> caught some attention with your comments on how Glenda is characterized in Oz the Great and Powerful, the movie, where she is the love interest. Uh, so, I, yeah, I was making some notes, and I said, Oz the Great and Powerful, because I knew you were going to read this, and I said, what a mess. <laughs> Which is my comment on it. I got a lot of trouble for that. Um, <laughs> my, oh, golly, um, well, timeline-wise, it makes no sense with what we know. So, I mean, we can sort of get rid of that um, altogether. Um, it's clearly out of canon and out of the normal Aussian timeline. Uh, my problem with it is that it took um, three really powerful female characters and turned them into, you know, chicks just love dudes. And, you know, Glinda here is this incredibly powerful um, a sorceress she knows that he's a humbug um she's putting up with him because he's a he's this sort of figurehead and she's the power behind the throne as she is with in with Ozma, of course but then she has this sort of romance with him that i find incredibly out of character and um oh god you know i i I, I guess it bothered me that that the only way apparently that that she could be um relevant somehow is by this romance that she has with um this this uh, the, with the wizard and i just i found it i found it annoying as hell and uh, but that's just me there are some other depictions of glenda having romances but usually the person involved is uh someone more worthy of her yeah, <laughs> as a powerful means. magical worker than uh mr diggs yeah not a douche <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I, I just found that th I watched it again. In fact, the other night, um, like on purpose and everything, and um, I found it. I, like I said, I just found it. I didn't find it any less troubling than I did a couple of years ago when I got myself an enormous amount of trouble on the last panel I was on about this. The MGM movie. Uh, it brings on Glenda at the start of Dorothy's journey. It's for, there's much more dramatic unity that way. She does appear throughout. She rescues uh, Dorothy from the poppy field and so on. And yet that means that she has been hiding knowledge from Dorothy all along, which really, really annoys me. <laughs> and I wonder if other people feel that same way. Please validate. She should have saved the dog. That was the first thing she should have done. I was only worried about the dog. The dog... <laughs> Um, I may be still having a very small four-year-old's response to this um, because when I first watched it, all I cared about was what happened to the little dog. <laughs> Rescue Toto, right from the beginning. And instead, he uses the four of them to bring down another ruler, be two, two other rulers that she doesn't feel like dealing with herself. I find her very annoying in the film. She should have saved the dog! <laughs> this but she should have saved the dog <laughs> well she needed to keep the dog around to expose the wizard and uh maybe yeah <laughs> i like the dog <laughs> <laughs> any other uh, thoughts on billy burke as glinda i mean she did well for what is basically a pretty thankless role um largely because the role does not make a lot of sense um i feel that's that's partly because um the film itself was so leaning into the idea of that's just a dream. It's not reality. You are going to have to go back to reality. So the focus on dream really makes her role in the film make even less sense than it does in the book. Because at least in the, in the book, yeah, she doesn't do anything to help, but she wasn't there at the beginning either. She waits yeah. for people to come to her. Uh, and that her going immediately uh, and saying, oh, okay, I go down this road, overthrow the wizard, overthrow the wicked witch. Great. 
okay, you didn't have to do any of that. You could have just clipped your heels together and saved your dog and been home. Um, it does not make her to be the nicest person, even though we are meant to think she's a lovely, kind, wonderful person who's helping Dorothy. Mm, maybe. maybe. Well, maybe she is helping Dorothy, but not in the most, I, I mean, part of the whole point of the, of the book and the movie and everything is Dorothy's journey. And if, I, if Glenda comes in and, and drops in to solve everything, then Dorothy doesn't have her journey. And admittedly, saving the dog is kind of like not good uh, or not failing to. Um, but I never, at least, but you know, I never got the feeling like she was doing it to be malicious. I always got the feeling that, um, that she was sort of this distant but kind character and maybe she had other stuff on her plate i don't know but uh um I, I i didn't get that same sensation from her but you know your mileage may vary i also got to watch it on a black and white tv about this big and it wasn't until i was well into high school that i discovered oh it's also in color <laughs> and it Very was still big. my favorite movie yes mm -hmm. thank you <laughs> anyway mm -hmm. To be honest, that's a this sort of thing is a plot hole in eighty percent of films. <laughs> where, um, if you had just said this one thing, and why didn't you? Or you know, whatever. Um, why don't you dump him? Whatever. Um, I remember reading this strange article when I was a kid about all the questionable things in the movie. I mean, to the point of sort of absurdity, like when did Dorothy stop to go to the bathroom? Um, which is not something I've ever wondered. Um, but now I can't stop thinking about it. Um, so yeah, so it, 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 I think like probably the majority of people that see the movie just kind of washed over me, especially when, you know, you're still sucking your thumb or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. We are exposed quite early. So it's just sort now, of there. Yeah. Now, in terms of plot holes, that's interesting. I was thinking about this uh, in preparation that when Baum introduced the Great Book of Records at the end of The Emerald City of Oz, he was basically doing what the MGM people would do um, many years later, which is to say, uh, well, Glenda knows all this stuff already, uh, and which immediately brings up the question of why doesn't she do something about it already? Uh, and in fact, in that book, she immediately says, well, I've, I've already cut off Oz. Uh, I did it 25 minutes ago. Um, and then she uses, the book becomes a plot point in some other uh, Oz books, but it's also a, an impediment that Baum has to get rid of in The Lost Princess of Oz and some others. So um, is Glenda too powerful for good storytelling? Or does her character... Uh, get around that problem because she's just not going to intervene and she very ha definitely has to. What do people think? Well, there's, there's uh, s several indications in some of the later books that there are people out there that are much more powerful than she is. So I don't think it's as powerful as she is. Uh, she doesn't compare to the private citizen as far as I can tell. Um, so she's not up to him. Uh, all of the, Demons were walking into Emerald City while Ozma was like, oh, this isn't a problem. We'll be fine. <laughs> <sighs> uh, and, um, many of those also appear to be m more powerful than she is. So I think that that might even help explain why she holds herself back in reserve. She is the reserve. And if Ozma does not figure out how to defend the Emerald City at some point, she's going to have to uh, come in and, you know, help save Oz and help do all of this. Um, but she, I think she does kind of restrain herself because she's not up to meeting every single bad guy out there. There's also the thing about learning. I mean, this kind of goes back to um, the reason why, you know, her not intervening in the movie and, and in necessarily in the book. I mean, there is this thing about learning and, and Ozma is never going to learn how to be a ruler if, Linda is constantly stepping in to save her. Um, and that's, you know, to me, and for somebody who values learning as much as she clearly does, that might be an important thing to her. I don't know. Just a, just a wild guess. 
I, mean, I think Glendavaz in particular, you know, this comes to the fore in chapter one, um, where she says, you know, I don't think we should really get involved with this. And Osmond says, of course. And then Glenda says, well, we could send the wizard in advance. And Osmond says, no, I have to go myself. Yeah. Ozma is very much this micromanager and Glenda is, I don't know, macro manager. Is that a thing? <laughs> um, and, you know, she established precautions. She gave Dorothy this alarm ring and, and uh, all that sort of thing. And it was following along in, in the book, uh, from what I recall. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I do have the sense that she would do the DSX Machina thing if, if absolutely required, but she really does not want to do that. Um, she's very much a fan of standing back, I think. There's a moment, I, I also reread that book in preparation for this year, and uh, there's a moment where uh, they, she has received the alarm from the ring. She knows Dorothy is in trouble. She has gone and looked up in the book to figure out some things, and she goes to the Emerald City, and everybody wants to come along, and she says, well, I could get there right away in my stork chariot, but I'll go walking with all of you. <laughs> and it, <laughs> she just seems to have a lot of confidence that her good friends, Nosma and Dorothy, are not in imminent danger <laughs> uh, because she does uh, take the lovely stately approach to solving problems instead of zooming in. Uh, how does this, how do you see this, uh, Mari, you've written uh, a lot about Ozma's approach to ruling. How do you see this fitting into that greater theme? Well, I, they are two de very definitely different rulers. Uh, Ozma, for all the sweetness and whatever, is outside of certain books where she's like, yes, let's just have people invade the Emerald City. Why not? It'll be fun. Um, I'm not over that either. There are certain parts of us I am never going to get over, and that is one scene of them. Uh, but there very much is the look at the active ruler who is in the center of the country, has by her own account, and Glenda Vaz has said, oh, yeah, well, um, I am not doing my job to its fullest extent because I don't know everybody in Oz, and I'm going to have to try to, versus the yeah, I'll just stay back in my castle and send out others. Uh, and it's an interesting rulership contrast on how do you help people. Ozma seems to want the bigger personal gestures. She's the one that's always having the parties. She's the one trying to meet and entertain everybody. Glinda is, I'll send other people. Let me get back to my books. Mm -hmm. And quite admirable in that, I would say. <laughs> Uh, does anyone have observations on how the later Oz authors used or didn't use Glenda? Uh, because I honestly, I don't have a lot of uh, recollections of her significant appearances. Uh, I didn't go back and look, um, but my recollection is that Thompson really dropped a lot of Bomb's characters by the wayside, and Glenda seems to have been one of them. Um, it's odd the ones that she picked up, like she has a books about Betsy, who not really anybody, well, at least not my, wow, this is a character I really want to know more about. Um, but she, uh, Thompson ended up getting rid of, or not getting rid of, but just not utilizing many of the big, big names, the big name characters, because they weren't hers. And I think, uh, you know, she looked at what, ha what she had done with the Tin Woodman and Scarecrow, and it doesn't feel like bombs. She knew that, so she went off and did her own characters. Uh, I cannot remember what Jack Snow did, so I can't speak on that. Um, but I feel that some of the same thing uh, was happening in the very last book, uh, Merry Go Round in Oz. The book that almost restored Ozma's, um, <laughs> Ozma's reputation as a ruler for me, um, because she's finally doing something, but she's also doing it the same way Glinda would if she sends people out to do there, I think Thompson was especially difficult, had a hard time with Baum's adult characters, like the Shaggy Man, uh, Cap and Bill, uh, and Glenda would certainly fall into that category. Uh, she was, did much better, or she felt, seemed to feel more comfortable with uh, Baum's animals and children, which she did bring back. Mm -hmm. um, and there is, um, it, it's, it's, uh, an interesting challenge when you have such a powerful character in the series, in the saga, 
what do you do with that person? And it almost feels like some people, some of the authors were not as comfortable with Glenda as Baum himself was. Um, any other uh, uh, observations or thoughts that people have uh, come up with in preparation for this conversation? Anything you uh, want to get out there? So I was struck by, so in the first book, she's just kind of there at the end. She serves the same function in Oz and Oz, basically, at the end, like how does Dorothy get back home again? Um, so it's sort of a rerun. Um, in The Land of Oz, she has this huge role. Um, but then the next, the fourth and fifth books, Hardly. she's barely there. Um, then you have the Emerald City of Oz, and technically she's only there at the end, but really she's throughout the entire book. It's, it's really interesting. Um, if you look at the details, she created Bunny Bury, she created the Cut and Clip Village. Um, she placed the Forbidden Fountain in, in the Emerald City, um, which, which are all, which is the huge crux of the climax, obviously. Um, and then she's there at the end and, oh, by the way, she did this huge thing and Osmond just says, thanks. Um, so that was how Bomb chose to end the series or he thought he was ending the series. Um, the sort of Glenda's the undercurrent throughout this entire book. So I thought that was really interesting and not something I'd really thought about before specifically. And in some ways, that sort of replicates on a broader scale the pattern of Wizard uh, itself, where the journey of those four books, what he thought of as a series, all ends up going to Glenda at the end to make everything right, to make it safe for Dorothy and everybody else in the Emerald City to live uh, in Oz. <laughs> Sorry, he did set it up, but yeah, I mean, she is sort of the, she's the magic thing that ties everything together. She's as I said, the magic plot coupon. Um, but one thing that I, I didn't mention, and you know, you were talking about the difference between how Glenda rules and how Ozma rules. One of the things that struck me, and I didn't deep dive the way the rest of y'all did, um, but one of the things I recall was that um, Baum referred to Ozma of, often as girlish and being a girl, and these two girls are you know, spending time together um, Dorothy and Ozma, and um, you, you know this is sort of getting back to the notion of the adult versus the the child, and and I don't think that it's a straight, I don't think it's a straight one to one. I don't think she's a parent to either one of these characters, and I don't even think she's a big uh, big sister. She's too remote for that. But I think it is very striking that uh, Glinda is always referred to as an adult, as a sorceress, as as a person that is completely in control of her own destiny, whereas Ozma and Dorothy and some of the other characters have to be um, saved by Glinda from time to time, um, which is, in fact, what a regent or some, not a regent, but a, a, an advisor um, might, might do for someone to get them out of the trouble they might have gotten themselves into. So um, when I was remembering what I thought of her um, when I was reading them uh, as a child and as a young adult, Thank you very much to Mari Ness, Caroline Spector, and Atticus Ganaway for being part of our panel discussion. And we will now shift to questions from the audience. Us questions which have been collected uh, online over the past couple of days and which you are welcome to send in through the chat function of this uh, Zoom program. Thanks very much. Okay, folks. I'm going to stop my echo. Uh, I'm now going to ask uh, Atticus and Mari and Caroline to unmute themselves, uh, if you can, uh, so that we can continue the discussion. Uh, again, I welcome uh, any uh, uh, questions asked in the comment section. Uh, one of the things which came up twice uh, on the um, Let's see, I'm, I'm going to have to ask, uh, okay, okay. One of the things that came up twice on the uh, uh, comments elsewhere was this theory that Glenda is actually a hidden antagonist in the MGM movie. And we discussed this a bit, uh, but does she get in the way of Dorothy or 
Uh, is that not what, an, what it means by being an antagonist there? Um, and also, uh, uh, we didn't actually discuss Glenda in Wicked, but there is obviously a continuity between the way she is presented in the MGM movie and the way Gregory Maguire and then his collaborators for, for the Broadway show made Glenda a bit, um, much, a lot more syrupy, a lot more like Billy Burke as a young, uh, the Billy Burke character of the young woman than like uh, Baum's character. So uh, more thoughts on, if any, on Glenda in the MGM movie and in Wicked. And Atticus, I see that you are unmuted, so I'm going to I, ask you first, just because I know you can talk. Sure. Um, I hope my fellow panelists are able to unmute. Um, but I will, I will wrap the clock if I need to for, for their sake so they can chime in. Um, now, I, I, I've certainly heard that theory about Glenn being the antagonist over, over the years. Um, I think um, as we touched on it at one point, it's basically the plot hole the movie created by combining two characters, one from the beginning and one from the end. And one from the beginning didn't have Glenda's knowledge, but in the combined, obviously, she would have had that knowledge, so why didn't she convey it? Um, so, I mean, that's, there was no intention, of course, to have her be an antagonist, but um, it's a fun sort of concept. Um, I think of her more as sort of um, a channel where she's nudging Dorothy in a certain direction and um, without, without any inherently, you know, bad intent. Um, that's sort of the way I think of it. Okay, and um, Caroline? Uh, I missed part of, I was so busy paying attention to trying to get myself unmuted that I missed part of the question. But I'm assuming okay. we're talking about Glenda and, and how she functions in terms of whether or not she's antagonistic to the characters. Uh, antagonistic and also the character in Wicked uh, in either of its forms, if people have had a chance to see that or read that. Um, uh, well, I think I think Wicked, the, the Broadway show, is utterly charming, and I don't feel as if it has a whole lot to do with anything else but itself. Um, but I'm just going to get myself in so much trouble. I often think that the reason why Glenda doesn't do anything, and we did touch on this earlier, is that um, there's it's not exactly the hero's journey, but it's a journey that these characters are making. And, and I really do believe that um, she is someone who is not going to keep them from making that journey, from growing up, from experiencing things that they need to experience. So I've never gotten the feeling that she was antagonistic. Um, and I hate Wicked the book so much that I don't even talk about it. So that's just me. But anyway. Okay. And Mari, any thoughts? on um, those areas what was just said about uh wicked the book um tends to be my feelings about portions of wicked the musical uh i don't think you can tell in this video i'm currently sitting in a wheelchair and wicked the, the uh musical push back just i guess this i don't know if you can tell even when they push back so it's not important but um wicked the musical is an extremely painful experience to sit through if you're in a wheelchair and Glinda is part of that reason. So I mentally actually cut her off from the Glinda of the books and the Glinda of the MGM movie, because even with my comments about the Glinda of the MGM movie, uh, not saving the dog, she's still a much nicer, <laughs> much better person. Um, and not as painful to me emotionally um, as the Glinda of Wicked, where the Glinda of Wicked sings a song about how awful it is to live in a wheelchair. It is, and I know many people love a Wicked. Uh, there's reasons to love the, to love the musical. Um, I don't want to down the entire musical because it's got great songs. There was a dragon. Um, you know, it's, it is, I can see where it's a lot of fun, but that first act still has a character who considers herself good coming out on stage and telling the entire audience that it's miserable and not any fun and you can't really have a life uh, if you're in a wheelchair. It's extremely painful. 
So I can't see her as a good character in that musical. And in fact, she pains and she makes the entire musical very painful um, experience for me. Uh, does that make her an antagonist overall? No, I really don't think so. Um, I know I've <laughs> this is my second down on, on uh, uh, Glinda comment of the uh, panel, but I do think certainly the original Glinda and yes, even the Glinda of the MGM movie, um, they're meant to be good. They're meant to be characters that we emulate and we try to be like. So. Okay, well, thank you. That's as valuable to have uh, perspectives that would not, not necessarily have occurred to us. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, one of the questions that came in while we were talking uh, is about the um, influence of Matilda, uh, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, and I guess also Maud Gage Baum on the creation of Glinda, either as a character or in a more general way, the, um, uh, the strong women of Baum's books. And so uh, uh, does anyone have, uh, want to share comments on that? I, I guess I can. Um, one thing that didn't come up in the panel, um, it was the fun detail that, that I saw that popped out at me. There are two characters um, that are described as being a little afraid of Glinda. And um, they are the patchwork girl and um, the glass cat, both of whom are very strong personalities. Um, and so it reminds me in a way of how Maude was sort of the disciplinarian in, in the Baum family, as opposed to Frank. Um, and, you know, I wonder if that is a little part of Glenn's personality because she, she does sternly admonish people at, at times and um, yeah, could be a connection. Interesting thought. And of course, um, in our society, uh, the scary woman is not supposed to be a, a good model, and yet clearly Baum was uh, presenting Glinda as uh, somebody everybody should respect. Um, uh, Nathan is asking here, isn't Button Bright uh, intimidated by Glinda? And uh, I would have to say, looking at their conversation in Linda of Oz, where she tells him quite strictly, you know, never do that again. And he said, it's not my fault. And uh, so <laughs> I don't think he's intimidated by pretty much anyone. Uh, Mari or Caroline, do you, uh, you want to talk about uh, the feminist uh, roots of the Glenda character? Anything to say there? Um, not, not so much. I mean, the one thing I'll just say about her character is that she's daunting. And I imagine if your um, house is run by very, very strong women who have a lots of opinions and strongly probably strongly worded opinions, I think that that could be quite daunting. Um, and that might have come through in his creation of, of Glenda and, uh, and, you know, the, um, the characters that are afraid of her, um, that might be part of what that's about is that, you know, she's quite an imposing figure. Um, so, but that's pretty much it for me in terms of the, um, in terms of that. I mean, I'm I find, oh, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, and I'm guessing Mari has far more to say about it than I do. No, no, I, I really don't. I, I do find it interesting that the majority of uh, qualified or competent leaders uh, in the Oz books do tend to be the woman. And I do think that Bond was trying to make a point with that, uh, that whenever you get to the happy countries or the countries that are doing well, versus the places where you have a more miserable leader or where there's a problem or where people are lying. He definitely tends to see the, um, at least in the Oz books, uh, he really tends to have more of the women leaders being more competent. Uh, so I think that probably came from his home life, yes. Glenda of Oz is interesting in that regard because there are so many strong women, but they are both protagonist and antagonist. So you have uh, the Sudic as a, uh, your uh, typical uh, bad male ruler, but you also have Kuyo as a bad female ruler, and you have uh, Rira as somebody of moral ambiguity and just powerful, magical women everywhere. Um, one thing that we talked about, but we didn't uh, delve into is uh, the great book of records that Glinda owns. And I'm wondering, um, we never hear 
uh, where it comes from, how she got it, did she make it? Did she, what what is the story? Uh, any ideas about that? Uh, does it does it have um, uh, models uh, uh, in fairy tale literature of similar things, or does it reflect uh, 20th century uh, society in some way? And do you have a pet theory about where it comes from? I can share mine eventually. Google. <laughs> it's a Google. It's the Google News Feed. That it's a it's a test run to see how useful the Google News Feed can be. <laughs> <laughs> Or somebody else is saying uh, wikipedia.com. I tend to agree with that too, but definitely the Google News Feed. Yes, it feels like it's a modern uh, type of magic of information where you're not just looking for particular types of information, but it's coming at you as a flood. It's a newspaper. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a newspaper man. And where do you get all your information from during the time period that he was working? I mean, newspapers. And he was a newspaper man. I, I mean... I so in terms of having a theory about where it came from, um, the first thing that popped into my head when you said that, because I actually never considered it, but I thought, who did she loot that from? <laughs> I don't know who, but you know, I'm thinking there's somebody who's missing their book. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so, John, what's your opinion? What's your what's your theory? My theory is that it was given to her by Lurleen as part of her job of looking after Oz. And that Lurleen then arrived and later gave Ozma her magic picture for the same purpose. But it's just my theory. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, in that regard, are there, do you think that, uh, somebody asked, um, does uh, Glinda have hidden agendas? And I, this might've been about the Glinda of the MGM movie. But in, I also think we can ask, does Glenda have hidden agendas and secrets uh, in the books? And again, I have my own personal theories, but what do people think? Uh, is Glenda telling us everything she knows? Is Glenda telling Ozma everything she knows? And uh, Atticus, would you like to start? Um, I mean, I don't have a specific theory, but I know that there are references in the books to her not teaching the wizard everything she knows. And um, the fact that I mean, she does these things, these very large acts of magic unilaterally and doesn't even tell Ozma about them in advance um, or at all, leads me to think that there's certainly other things she just sort of takes care of and, and remains silent about. Mari or Caroline? Well, I think that there's a certain amount of power and knowledge. I mean, if you're, if you're withholding things that you know um, from somebody who might be able to use them, that gives you a lot of power over them. And, you know, for, for better or worse, Glenda is in many ways, and I think I said that in the, in the video, in the, um, when we had the discussion earlier, I mean, Glenda is, is the power um, behind the throne in Oz, I think. And I think that she's, I, I mean, I think she gives people what they need to know and nothing more. Um, she's not doling it out willy nilly. Um, and, uh, you know, that, I think that that says a lot about her keeping her cards pretty close to the best too. Yeah. Marty, come on, say something. <laughs> The, um, she doesn't come uh, to Oz with Lorene and the fairies. So I've always thought it was possible that she's there in part to make sure that whatever the fairies did to Oz doesn't disrupt the overall nature or uh, doesn't disrupt the people of Oz that much, also doesn't disrupt all the magic. She's, I wouldn't call her there, say that she's there as a spy exactly, but there is somebody, you know, who's going to keep an eye on things. And in that, I do think she has an agenda, not a negative one, but definitely an agenda of, yes, I'm going to be watching um, as this is going on, and I'm going to be keeping an eye on Oz, separately from what the fairies are doing. And, and back to per pet theories, one of my pet theories is that those signs around Oz that say this is a deadly desert, you cannot even touch it, don't even think about it. Those were simply put up by Glenda. We have no idea whether the sands are actually that deadly. But that was one of the ways she was uh, protecting Oz even before she put the barrier around. 
Again, my personal People, nobody theory. nobody threw a coin or something on it to figure it out. Would you do it? I mean, we 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 don't have any examples of people actually. No, die. no. I was just thinking. Yes, yeah, surely some child was like, eh, "Let's check this out." A very lucky child. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then they died. <laughs> well, well um, they run into the desert. In the land of Oz, it looks if that if that's the same desert. But now we're getting it's into ambiguous. Uh, yes, yeah, so we're now we're getting into um, uh, possibly after party discussion, uh, and it's almost nine o'clock in time for the next session. So I'm going to thank our panelists, uh, Mari, Atticus, and Caroline. I'm going to thank everybody who uh, has uh, put in questions and uh, joined in the discussion and uh, listened to us so kindly. And uh, we will look forward to uh, hearing all the conversation back and forth in uh, what is probably an, uh, uh, an, a cacophony of voices later on at the after party, but I'm certainly looking forward to it. So thank you all very much. Thank you for having me and thank Mari. And, and Thanks. yeah. This was fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so long, everybody. I, I forget what is the next thing in this session, but because uh, Colin was so careful to uh, make uh, it end in time for us, I feel like I have to make it end, this session end in time for whatever's at nine o'clock, if there is anything at nine o'clock. If instead there's just a video, I hope you enjoy the video, and thank you all for uh, being part of this. Thank you again. I can't figure out how to type it. Okay, just check the session. There is nothing else uh, live now. This is the time when people on the West Coast were, uh, it's, it's six o'clock there, so it's dinner hour, but you can go and pick up uh, the YouTube session on the making of the Claymation Gnome King and the killing of the Claymation Gnome King in Return to Oz. Uh, I hope folks uh, will uh, rejoin uh, for, uh, Let's see, uh, the Winky Awards and the Chair's Acknowledgements at 7.30 Pacific Time, followed uh, by the Oz Quiz at 9 o'clock Pacific Time. Uh, enjoy uh, your videos or your dinners or both. Take care. Thank you.